Zach, and all of a sudden, he goes, uh-oh. And I said, don't, don't say that. Don't, don't say that. And to myself, I said, I didn't say it to Kelly. I said, don't say that because the engine died. And I look back, and you know those times when you want to pray, and you know, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't want to be fearful. You know, and I want to pray, but Lord, it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to, by faith, I'm, it's okay. And he, mm, something's wrong. I can't get it started. I said, oh, goodness. We had some momentum. We were headed back toward the bank. And I'm like, okay, the bank gets any closer, I'm going to jump. Because this, this, this current is taking us out into the middle of the lake. And if you know Canton Lake, Canton Lake is huge. And if you know me, I'm, that, I'm not, that's not me. Okay? I, I, I'm, I'm at the lake because Pastor Zach wanted us to have a, a, a hangout with the men. I'm not at the lake because I choose to go there regularly on my own. Okay? I don't have a problem with lake, lake people. I don't have a problem going out the lake and hanging out. That's not a problem. I can camp and I've done that as a kid and everything. But getting in that water is a completely different element for me. Amen? That's, that's just something different for me. I don't, that's, that's just not, some people are fashioned a certain way, right? Some people have been trained up in that. Well, I wasn't trained up in that, amen? I'm trained up in a swimming pool, amen? I can swim in a swimming pool, and I can swim, I'm, I'm a good swimmer in the swimming pool. But not the lake, where the water goes where it wants to go, and it takes you with it, Amen? And we started drifting back into the middle of that lake, and I said, Kelly, I'm going to jump. <laughs> he said, don't jump. I said, Kelly, I'm, a, I'm about to jump. I can make it. Kelly's like, Hurr. I said, Zach, hey, Zach, I think we need some help. Can you do something over there? Is there something you can do? I don't, I don't know. And Zach's going, say what, brother? And Kelly's back there. Hurr. Hurr. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. And I see a boat coming up. It's like, hey. Mr. Boat Guy, can you see me? I know you can see me. Come on over here. Come on over here. He's waving back like this. I'm like, don't wave back. Come over here. <laughs> he comes whipping around there. Everything okay? I said, get closer. <laughs> and he said, is everything all right? And Kelly said, I don't know. I said, I think we might need a tow. <laughs> we might need a tow. Now, if we were on land, dry land, I'd be like any other man. We got it, right? But we're not on dry land. We're out here in this water. And this water's got control. And I don't. And that's a big deal. Amen? Let me tell you, folks. I just have to say, Lord, it's going to be okay. And the man in the boat said, you got it? Yeah, we got it. Now, do we have it? I don't know. The guy drives off in the boat, and I'm watching him slowly disappear. And I'm like, do you, it's, we're going to drift out in the middle of the lake or what? And he gets that little troll motor going. And I'm like, get us over there, Lord. Make that troll motor work through this wind and wave. And we got back up there and got the boat tied up. And I jumped off the boat. And I didn't say this to Kelly. I said it to me. I said, I'm not getting back on that boat. <laughs> as soon as my feet did, I said, I'm not, I'm not getting back on that boat. <laughs> I, I'm going to embrace that weakness. Amen. I'm not getting back on that boat. I just, he said, can you tie it up? Oh, I can tie it up. Bring throw there. We'll tie the boat up, but I'm not getting back on that boat. Y'all can have it. Kelly said, well, we'll see if we can fix it. And I said, and you'll be out there with, you'll be you and Zach. <laughs> it won't be me. And so that's the rest of the story. That's no knock on Kelly because he's done everything he could to make it a great time and continues to do so even now as we speak. But that's just a knock on me. I'm just letting you know that I'm that that what that's not my forte, amen. I looked out there later, and there was a couple of girls out there on a jet ski, and that wind was blowing, and they were womp, 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 womp. and I was just like, I'm mesmerized. Look at that. They're out there, and that wind is blowing like crazy. I don't see a boat. I just see jet ski out here by itself. Man, go for it. Go for. I'm gonna watch. I might even record, if in case something happens. But <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm gonna stand on the bank and watch it, amen. Well, that's just a little bit of my heart, and I'm not afraid to tell you that I'm not going to be out there in that water. Not like that. I even called my brother, who's got a bigger boat, and said, can you come out here with your bigger boat? Because <laughs> I'll get on a bigger boat, but I'm not getting in that little bitty boat. Not, not, not today. Not on this water. Amen. We've been talking about grace. And we've been talking about 
help. And I really felt that God gave me that word and laid it on my heart. And Pastor Zach has graciously tied right into it and felt like it's what God is speaking to him as well. And he, because he's speaking to us, we believe he wants to speak it to you. And we've talked about help. When we talked about not getting in, stuck in a place where we don't ask for help like Pastor Zach talked about in James. You know, if we have a need, God's made it, made it available to us to come to him and ask for. We have not because we ask not. So God has said, here's a way to get it, those things that I desire for you to have, keyword that I desire for you to have. You can receive those things when you ask, and you ask in faith, and you trust me that I'm going to get you where you want to be, where you need to be. Because I'm going to be honest with you. Back to that boat deal. When I stepped off on that, when I stepped off on that ground out of that boat, I said this. I said, first I said, thank you, Lord. Then I said, my wife was praying for me. Did I tell you that? I said, I said, I know my wife's praying for me. I know I was covered in that sense because when I stepped out, that's the first thing that came to my heart. My wife, my wife praying for me, bro. I'm telling you because I could have been out there. That we could have been drifting. And I think in hindsight, we probably thought, well, you know what, maybe that wasn't a big, good idea to be out there anyway. But thank God for the prayers of the saints. Thank God for those. My wife had, had later when I talked to her, she said, I couldn't sleep. I just had to, I couldn't, I was restless. So I just began to, I don't know if it's because you weren't here or what, but I just, I just wanted, I needed to pray. So I began to pray. I mean, you know, I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Amen? You should be thankful because we have, a, we have access to the Father. We have a way to get that. And it doesn't happen a lot of times because there's something that gets in the way. What gets in the way of us asking for help? Pride. Everybody say it. Pride. Pride gets in the way of us ha- asking for help. You cannot be prideful and ask for help at the same time. Once got, the, the pride's got to go before you can ask for help. It's got to be removed. God says he gives grace to the humble. Amen? But he resists the proud. He gives gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. One's got to go. God is willing, ready, and able. On our part, we've got to be willing to get rid of whatever's in our lives that's keeping us from him. How many of you have husbands that you're driving and they get lost and you're like, stop and ask somebody? Remember before we had the phones, right? Stop and ask somebody. Even now, even with the phones, you can still get to a place where you need to stop and ask somebody. I, I got it. You know what's keeping him on that course? I got it. It's called pride. I can figure this out on my own. When the, when the wife is simply saying, hey, just ask somebody. She even, she's wanting to catch people before you even get to the point where you're ready to ask somebody. Somebody could be standing on the corner. Hey, where is, amen? That's what my wife will do. Because I'm like, I got this. She's like rolling down. And like, There's a guy sitting on the corner. He's from around here. He's got a sign. He knows something. Hey, where is, right? She's not ashamed to do that. The thing that stands in between, between me and asking for help, and most men, even when it comes to health issues in our lives, we deal with it. We hold it up. We, we, we hold up this fake thing. We've got this weakness in our body, and instead of, ex, it, it, instead of exposing it to the one it, ne- it needs to be exposed to, God, at first, we hold on to it, and we think we can work through it. We, do, we go without asking for direction. Amen? And meanwhile, we're weak. And we're stumbling. We're fumbling. And we're unable to continue like we should because we haven't taken the time just to say, help. See, when we ask for help, what, what do we expect from God? Do we expect God to say, I've got it from here? Don't worry about anything else. You know, there's no requirement on your part. You don't have to do anything. Do you expect God to say, well, you should pull your own self up by your own bootstraps? You got your boots on? Pull them up. Cinch them up and you handle it. Do we expect God to do that? There's different expectations based on our relationship with him. 
based on how we identify who he is to us, it determines what we think God is saying. And that comes from our relationship with the word. And if we don't have a relationship with the word, then we are often, we fall into our own way of thinking, which is often given to us, received from the world and our environment. Hebrews 12 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. What is God's grace? You know, there was a survey done by a guy who has a ministry. The guy's name is John Bevere. Anybody ever heard of John Bevere? John Bevere is is a minister who's been ministering for 20, 30 years. Him and his wife, Lisa, they have a great uh, ministry called Hope International. And they, they go around the world ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and John says he did a survey of Christians, of believers, of about 5,000 Christians. And he surveyed them and he asked them a simple question. How do you define grace in one word? And of, all, of those 5,000, the top answer was salvation. The number two answer was God's unmerited favor or unmerited favor. The number two answer number, no, was unmerited favor. The number three answer was God's covering. How many are familiar with all of those examples? How many are familiar with those things? And how many those, know those things are true? Only 2% of the 5,000 that were were asked said that it is God's empowerment. Only 2%. But that's what the grace of God is. That's the primary purpose of the grace of God. Not salvation, but God's empowerment. That's the primary purpose of grace. And because often we've heard in the church... Where sin abounds, there much more grace abounds, and we put an emphasis on the covering of our sins by grace, which is true. We focused on that as a primary example of the grace of God. Amen? But the Word tells us differently. The fact is, is that we need God's grace because we're unable to do it in and of ourselves. The Romans 3, 23 says, For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we know we need God's grace. Even though we are Christians, we still have a battle. A battle that takes place in the spirit. And that battle is between the spirit and the flesh. It's our spirit man and the flesh. It's not the Holy Spirit. It is the spirit man that resides in us. That's the battle that takes place. Many people call it the battle of the mind. Right? It's the battle of our thoughts. How many of you know that there's a battle always going on there in our thought process? Pastor Zach even talked about it this morning. The turmoil, those things that we worry about, there's not even aches and pains in our body, but it's, it's so weighty. It brings us down. We're unable to function at the level that we should function at because this thing is back here going on in our mind. It's a natural response for us to try to do things eternally, externally. To try to bring strength into our lives externally. It's natural for us to try to be, I'm, not, I'm a man, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to cry about this. I'm, 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 I'm going to suck it up and I'm going to deal with this. I'm not going to ask for help. Amen? I'm not going to, I'm not going to go with nobody. We're just, I'm just going to go through, I'm going to tread through this alone. And we bring all of these external things in our lives. If it's those of us who are in the church, those of us who are believers, we do the same thing. We prop ourselves up with our external activities and they just become religious. And we go through the motions acting as if nothing's wrong. And we say the prayer, but do we believe it? We say the name, but do we, do we believe it? We focus on our strength as something as if it's good. And we prop it up to be something good. 
as if we're, we're obtaining some type of righteousness because of something that we're doing is good. Can I tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell? It's natural to want to pull something in and to try to make it fit your circumstance and prop you up and hold you there and you know it's a work of the flesh and not a work of the spirit. But you continue to reach for it. Why? Because your mind hasn't been renewed yet by the word of God. So we've got to continue to do that. It can be our religious activities such as attending church or daily devotion. Even our giving of offerings can be a religious outward appearance that makes us say, I'm good. I'm strong. If any of these things are done in our own strength for the purpose of earning God's righteousness, it's done in vain. Psalms 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they who labor, labor in vain. How many of you can honestly say there are times when I've been focused on building my own house with my own strength? I've been building my own spiritual house with my own strength. I've been pulling all of these things and I've been propping myself. But there's something behind all of that that's going on and I need help. There's something behind it. It's just a house of cards that's just in a matter of time it's going to fall if I don't get help. We brag, we boast about going to church as as if going to church makes us a Christian. It doesn't. There are many sitting in a church that are from that are far from God. The parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 is an example of this. How is this an example? Because there's people who are in the church. Jesus is speaking to the ten virgins. Virgins, symbolic of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ waiting for the bridegroom. He is talking to the body and he says that five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. That's half the church. How do we know, how does the story go? He says as they are waiting they hear the bridegroom cometh and the five that are wise have their lamps, and their lamps are ready. And the five that are foolish say, can we borrow some of your oil so that we can trim our lamps? They said, no, lest we not have any for ourselves when he comes here. I want to be able to see him come. I want to be prepared. I want to be ready. He says, go and buy your own. So what do they do? They leave to go buy their own. And what happens when they're gone? The bridegroom comes, and he takes the virgins, and they go into the marriage supper. And the door's closed. And they're stuck outside of the marriage supper. And they go and they knock on the door. Jesus says, you can't come in. I don't know you. You're stuck out. Why? Why is that? Because they weren't prepared. Do you know that the oil of 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 the lamps is symbolic of the Holy Spirit? Do you know the light of the lamp is symbolic of the Word of God? that illuminates our way? Do you know that the God, God wants us to be prepared for him? But there comes a time when they're asking for help and it's too late. I believe that Jesus is saying that half the church is ready. The other half only appears to be ready because they all look the same. They all have a proper essentials. Everything's ready to go. They're all ready to go until they hear his voice. Until he comes. And they're not ready. Because it exposes their condition. There's coming a time when Jesus is going to come and we shall see him like he is. It's going to be made known. But you know what else is going to be made known? How we are. It's going to be made known how we are. Don't wait. Get help now. How do we see this? We see this, and where do we see it? We see this with Paul. Paul writes a letter to the church at Corinth. And in this letter, he begins to talk to the church 
about this strength being drawn in from external means. Some put their confidence in their achievements. Some put their accomplishments or their, 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 their strength in their, in their finances. Some put their strengths in their religious activity. Some put their strength in their status in the community. Some put their, things, uh, their, their strength in their works and what they've accomplished and what they've done. And Paul is addressing the church at, at Corinth here in 2 Corinthians 12. Starting in, in, in verse 1, he says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in body or in the, or whether in body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up in the paradise, whether in body or, or out of the body, I don't know. But God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my behalf, I will not boast except of my weakness. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Here's a key thing right here. So to, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should, be, should lead me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So that the power of God, of Christ, may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul is saying that when you embrace your weakness, God's power is revealed in his grace. God's power is revealed in our weaknesses. When we embrace them, God shows up with an exchange. I'll take your weakness and I'll raise you my power. But when we hold on to our strengths, and this is what Paul is addressing here, he's saying, I can boast, but I'm choosing not to boast. I can talk about all of these things, but I'm not going to talk about these things. Fourteen years ago, I was up in the third heaven. I saw revelations of things that I can't even talk about. And I'm going to leave it at that. What is he saying? I've had plenty of time to boast about the accomplishments and the spiritual experiences and all the things that I've gone through. I've had plenty of time to talk about that in the time, but I haven't. Why? Because the weakness is where, my weakness is where I find God's strength. In my weakness, God's strength, his grace, his grace, I find his strength in that. Paul is saying that when you embrace your weakness, God's power is revealed in his grace. And here's the key thing. He was speaking to a church at Corinth. Corinth was known for its big metropolis, much like New York, much like uh, London, much, much like you know Houston or Dallas or any big city you can think of, great big buildings and, and, and powerhouses in the economic section, powerhouses in Silicon Valley, like we have the, the, the technology and the, and the things that are moving and advancing there, the, the mecca for, for minds and, 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 and people who are of academia and want to talk about their, their knowledge and, and, and gathering those things. They were all puffed up in those things. 
And Paul is acknowledging that you're getting influenced by the world because you don't know that, that, that power resides in your weakness. So you're embracing these outward things that are so visible to you, that you know that's part of your culture, that we, even here right now, we tend to embrace when we don't know the word of God, when we don't know the power of grace, we, we embrace the, those external things and we try to prop ourselves up with those things. Paul writes the second letter to the church of Corinth because of his concern for the church's acceptance of false apostles who just like the people of Corinth boasted in their accomplishments and in their prestige. Teachers were discussing how, how Jesus, they were followers of Jesus Christ. That's what these false teachers were saying, that they were followers of Jesus Christ. They were fake apostles. There was nothing real in them. They were boasting of themselves, which was an identifier, should have been a marker from the beginning. If they're not talking about Jesus and they're talking about themselves, that should be something that the people should have recognized, the church should have recognized right, right away. That they were puffing up themselves rather than lifting up the name of Jesus. Because it's the name of Jesus when it's lifted up that will draw all men unto him. Rather than when we lift ourselves up, yeah, we may draw all men unto us. And that's what a lot of times you see you see, we all understand when we see people who are big-headed and they boast of themselves and they talk about their accomplishment. They talk about themselves as if they've never done anything wrong. They've never made any mistakes. Everything is perfect in their lives. The problem's not with me. The problem's with you. The problem's with someone else. It's always pointing the finger somewhere else. Amen. Paul understands that the church at Corinth is impressed with the wrong thing. But nonetheless, the church is still impressed with these so-called apostles. So Paul flips the script. And he says, so you think they're impressive? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's impressive. Paul proceeds to lay out his credentials and his resume. Paul even talks about his spiritual experience. Paul talks about it only to say, I can't talk about it. He is saying, I have a lot to boast about. I have more to boast about than they have to boast about. And you know me. You're reading my letter, aren't you? <laughs> you know me. You know that what I've said before is true and what I'm saying now is true. You remember the time I was, I was held captive and because the angel of the Lord opened the gate in the jail and I got out of the jail and they lowered a basket and I got in it and I was taken out of the window of the city. You remember those things. Paul is saying, there's a history here that I'm bringing up to you and I want you to see. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 11, 21. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. What he's saying right here is this. This is not my pattern. This is not how they know me as a boaster. People don't know me this way. People know my character. So I'm being foolish. I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. He's saying, I know I'm speaking as a fool, but even think about me even speaking as a fool, that's kind of a boast that I'm something that I'm not. So I'm even just telling you that this is not who you normally know, normally see me as. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman right now, but what I'm trying to get, if there's a point that I'm trying to make, that's what Paul is saying. I'm talking crazy. They are, I am. They are, I am. I'm a follower of Christ. We know they're not followers of Christ. I'm talking crazy, but listen to what I'm saying. I'm making a point here. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. How many of you know that Paul had scars? And people saw those scars. Have you ever been around anyone who's had some real scars? Have you ever, had, have you ever been around someone that's had their, had their face beaten to the point where they're, they're, when they healed, it, the, 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 the tissue underneath it had scar tissue and, and they were, their face was deformed? 
we've all had some injuries somewhere on our bodies where, where you can look back and say, I remember this scar right here. A little nick on my arm right there. Got it when I was about four years old. A chandelier fell over my head, and my mom yanked me out of the way. And just as she's yanking me out of the way, the piece, piece of the chandelier caught my arm and cut me right there. A chunk of skin come out. I remember that. And I got the scar to prove it. When I was seven years old, I was spinning around in my front yard, and I fell down on the ground, and I landed on a piece of grass on my head, and I got up with a piece of glass sticking out of my head and blood running down my face. I've got this big scar right here because I remember it. Those in my life can look at that scar and say, I remember when you got that scar. Those who are not in my life say, I recognize him because he has that scar. Amen? It was the same way with Paul, but even more so. Because Paul said, I've been beaten. I've been in prison. And they didn't pat me on the back. They didn't treat me kindly. I've got the bruises. I can prove to you. What he's saying is, look at them, look at me. What he's saying is, I've got every reason to boast, but I'm not going to. But I'm making a boastful point so that you can see the importance of the point that I'm trying to make. Let's read on. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. Five times Paul was whipped 200 lashes. Actually, 196, but 195. He got lashes on his back that were meant to kill a man. You think he's got some scars? You think he's got something to boast? You think he wants, just let me take off this garment so you can really see who, who have laid it down to follow Christ? And Paul says, but I don't embrace that. Let's go on. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Now I've been adrift. <laughs> on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from all my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. Paul is, re, re, he is, what he is doing here is that he is showing people, this is my heart. He is saying, of all of this, all these things that I've just talked about, it, they mean nothing. They mean absolutely nothing. The credentials, the resume, the spiritual experience, even the history that you are aware of about me. It's all true, it's all great, but it's not what Paul has chosen to embrace. I've chosen to embrace my weakness. I've chosen to look at my the things that you don't that you don't see. The weakness in me, I chose, I've chosen to embrace those things. Do you remember in Romans, Romans verse one? Paul says. When he's introduced, Paul, he introduces himself as a slave. What's a slave? He has no identity. He has no lineage to go back to. He has no, no one to claim that that's my own and these are mine and I'm his. All he knows is this is my master and I'm his bondservant. Paul says, I am a servant, I am a slave to Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That's what Paul says, this is my weakness. My weakness is, I know who I am, I know I've been called, I know I've been chosen, but I've chosen to embrace the fact that I'm nothing and he is everything. Philippians 3, verse 4 through 8 says, Though I myself have reason for confidence, in the flesh also. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. What am I showing you here? I'm showing you here consistency in Paul's life. If anyone else thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, of Hebrew, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as of the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness and the law, I'm blameless. 
Paul is saying, look, check box. Check box. Check. They're all checked. There's nothing missing on this road of things that I've accomplished in my own strength. Things that I can hold up and say I'm right, standing. Things that I can hold up and say I'm good. He says I've chosen to uncheck the boxes. Because I've chosen to embrace my weakness. Why? Because there's a consistency in Paul's life that says this. Christ above everything. There's a consistency in Paul's life, whether he's speaking to the, the Philippians, the Colossians, the Thessalonians, the Thessalonians, or the, or the church of Corinth. It doesn't matter. Paul is saying the same thing to every one of them. I'm nothing, and Christ is everything. So I embrace my weakness. I embrace it. He goes on to say, Indeed, I count everything as loss. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. That rubbish is another word in the Hebrew. You think of another word that, think that says what rubbish is and Paul is even expressing it even stronger than that. That all of that stuff before me is junk. In German you'd say zelch. Zero. Nothing. In order that I may gain Christ. Philippians chapter 3. Let's look on down in chapter uh, verse 12 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it known. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what I believe Paul is saying here. Remember when Paul says, I've been to the third heaven? How many of you would have been saying, hey, uh, I've got a book called The Third Heaven that I've been to. I've, I've got a, a tape or a CD collection, me preaching on the fact that I've been to the third heaven and I've seen the third heaven. Anybody? I've got some T-shirts for sale and some rich bands out there that say, third heaven, looking forward to it someday like Paul. Paul said, I can boast about all those things. And probably any one of us probably would be boasting about those things. But Paul says, I don't want those things. I don't need the title that everyone is seeking on the job. I don't need the money in the bank that the world thinks is going to bring happiness. I don't need the image of the prettiest face and best hair or best clothes or the best car, you name it, the best whatever. There's nothing wrong with having things. There's a problem when those things have you and you put your boasts in those rather than putting your boasts in the Lord. And Paul is saying that grace is the power of God that strengthens me. Grace is the power of God that propels me, that moves me, that causes me to go forward. Everything that is propped up in life means nothing compared to what is to come. I believe that's what Paul was thinking. That everything that that, that you have propped up, I've been to the third heaven and he saw something that was greater than anything he could ever imagine. That's why he says, I'm going to stay low and Jesus will stay high and I'm going to press toward the mark. I'm going to twist, press toward the goal because I've seen something. And it's greater than anything. I don't, want to, I don't want to ruin it because I'm focused on the wrong thing here. Because there's something greater yet to come. And because I've seen it, I'm going to lay it down. I'm going to press. How many of you have spent time and God has showed you in prayer of things to come? 
God has showed you of things that come that this earth can't compare to. That he has whispered in your ear those little sweet somethings that says, I've got something greater for you. Don't get focused on your inadequacies and forget about me, but embrace your inadequacies because my strength is found there. Don't make your inadequacies a problem, but yet allow those inadequacies to be something that you embrace because I've placed them in your life for the purpose of saying there's something greater. Trust me. See, I asked Pastor Zach if I could talk about him this morning. He always talks about me and one will talk about him. A week or so ago, he talked to me in private and he said, man, I've been up at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning and I've just been struggling. And I, feel like I, I feel like I don't have it. I don't have what it takes to be a pastor, to be a leader. But yet, but yet, I know that I'm called to be a pastor. I know that I'm called to be a leader. I know I'm called to do these things, and God, God's shown me these things, but I feel so inadequate. I feel like I'm missing in so many ways. I look at I look at the body, and I'm like, we should be growing more. I, I look at things that we're doing in the church, and I'm like, we're doing things, but we should be doing more. I look at the, the community, and I see people out there, and I'm like, we should be reaching more. We should be praying more, but I, I feel so weak. And he shared that with me. My heart just broke for me. Because I've been in that same spot. So I, I, we parted and talked. We parted and left. And the Lord just spoke to my heart and just said, you know, that weakness that he is talking about is my strength. It's what's going to keep him in check. It's what's going to keep him focused on the things that I've called him to do. Knowing that I can't measure up. So what Paul said. God put this thorn in my flesh, the messenger in my flesh, to keep me from becoming big-headed and puffy. He, keep, he put this thing in me so that I can always see it. I begged him three times to take it away. And he says, no, my Grace, my power is sufficient. No matter what you're going through, no matter what situation you have in your life, you can come boldly before the throne of grace. Before the throne of God, and you can receive God's grace. You can receive His power. I told Pastor Zach the other night, I said, I remember a story of Israel Holton, how many of you know that Israel Holton sings all those good worship songs, You Are Good, and all of those songs that we've, we've become so familiar with over the years. And He said he was with one of his buddies, an NFL buddy, and he went to a, a dealership there in Dallas, and he was hanging out with him. He says, I got to stop by the Rolls Royce dealership. He was kind of boasting, you know, and but he needed to stop by there, and, and, and he ended up walking around on the showroom floor of the Rolls Royce dealership. And he's looking at all of these cars, and he walks over to this one car, and he looks over on the window sticker. And other than the price sticking out, he wanted to know some of the specs. He said, I wonder what that horsepower is. And he looked at that, and he saw on the horsepower, and he went, huh, that's strange that it says that. But he turns, and he goes to another vehicle. He looks at the sticker on that window. He looks for horsepower. Says the same thing. Go over here. Looks on this window. Sticker. Same thing. You know what it says for horsepower? It says sufficient. You know what that means? No matter what you throw at it. Whatever, whatever you need in this vehicle for horsepower, we got you covered. The power is here. Why? Because we are not known for making great car engines first. We're known for making great jet engines. And because we're known for making great jet engines, we don't have a problem with putting enough sufficiency in a car. 
See, we have the God of the universe as our Lord. He's created all of the universe. He has created the stars and space, the sun, and he's chosen to create us, and we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And there's a sticker on us when we've embraced Jesus Christ and we embrace his weakness, and it says, my grace is sufficient. The power that we need, no matter what's thrown our way, no matter what the challenges that may come our way, we can look at it in the face and we can say, whew, that looks tough. But I got a gas pedal here. And it's called grace. And I can embrace it. And I went back to that window after talking to Pastor Zach. After we talked, I went by the window at the pharmacy. I rolled up to the window and I said, I just want to tell you that I love you. And I want to tell you, and you're not in this alone. I should have been here for you. I should have known that in my man, in my spirit, man, that you were going through that because we're brothers in Christ. When one of us goes through something, how many of you know we share the burden? We share the load. And you can call on me when you find yourself in need of help. We lean on God first. The Bible says, lean not to your own understanding. But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So I said, you can lean on me, brother. You know what I'll do? I'll lean on you. And that's what the body of Christ has to have, an understanding. We can look at those things in our lives and know those obstacles may be in front of us. Those things may be in us, but it's all for a plan and a purpose for God to work in our life. We don't have to shirt back and be afraid and hold on to something that's going to prop us up for a short time. But we can embrace the very weakness, that feeling that I'm inadequate and say, Lord, I know that in and of myself I can do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. Stand in your feet. Father, I thank you for every person in this house this morning. I thank you, Lord Father, for the grace that you've given us. that we have access to you, Father. That you've opened a door that allows us to step in and allows us to come before you. And we humble ourselves. That's the key, church. We humble ourselves and we ask God for his grace. That no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, we know that we have a sufficiency that resides within us. That we're able to withstand it. We're able to endure it. We're able to overcome it. We're able to walk through this thing in our lives. Knowing that we've chosen to embrace it and not to run away from it. If sin is your issue, and you've had issues with sin, God's grace is sufficient to keep you from falling. If you've had struggles in your mind, fear, anxiety, pain, sickness in your body, problems in your finances, problems everywhere, great and small, God's grace is sufficient when you humble yourself and you say, Lord, I'm not going to act fake and prop myself up and do all of these religious things and do all these things that the world does but instead I'm going to do what you say do. and I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to come to you and I'm going to simply say help and he is our help our president in a time of need come on up Pastor Zach you grab that mic I want you to say what's on your heart. I just want to pray. I want you to pray with me, please, everyone. 
Father God, we pray that you will penetrate our hearts with the understanding that has been brought for us today that your grace is all we need. Not our plans, not our hopes, not our fears. Nothing we need is greater than what you already have the sufficiency for and is found in your grace through our weaknesses. So we just ask, Father, that this takes root as the word of God has been said. He's speaking the word that has been written by the word, Lord. And we need that word to to be seated in our hearts and to grow roots and to bear a harvest in our lives, Father. So we just pray for everyone in this house that they do not miss the opportunity to understand what's being said and to allow it to settle into the soil of this of their heart and to bear a harvest for the kingdom of God, Father. So we just call on you that you will cause us to make this understanding real and it will make an effect in our lives because we know that it's highly effective. It's always effectual. The word of God is always availing and powerful, but we have to receive it and we have to plan it and we have to attend to it and we have to trust it's going to work and not allow anything else to grow up in its place. So we thank you, Father, for this word. Thank you for Pastor this morning for he's tried to share from his heart. Thank you, Father God, that in our weakness we are strong in you. In Jesus' mighty name, your grace is sufficient. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're dismissed, and we want to tell you guys that you are welcome to come out to the Big Bend area at Canton Lake this afternoon if you have time at 2 p.m. If you need to know what to do, you come into town of Canton and you go west like you're going to go to the lake. And most everybody here probably knows that. But what we recommend is instead of taking a right to go by the casino and go to the lake dam, go one mile further and there is going to be a black top road to take a right on. There will be a water tower on your left. It's one mile further than the turn that almost everybody takes to go to the dam. One mile further. Water tower left, take a right, go to the end. Hutton's Corner's on your left, Big Ben's on your right. Go down in there to B4 and B5. If you can come this afternoon at 2 p.m., we're going to have a fish fry. Please come if you can. Be blessed in Jesus' name this week, no matter what.